Thanks. Well, thank you all very much for being here, and I, I'm honored to be here celebrating Gina's photography. It's fantastic. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've had a chance to see it, and so to be asked to be part of this has been, you know, is a real, a real treat. So, and welcome to my uh, comrades from Emory University and uh, my colleagues who have come to see me as well. So, thank you all for, for attending. Um, I'm going to tell you what I've learned about coyotes, very interesting animals. Um, you know, I often say that people are very curious about them, um, but they're also sometimes concerned. And so I hope that, uh, you know, what I have will, to tell you tonight will allow you to learn a bit more about these, uh, really what I think are remarkable animals. So uh, my intent here is what I'd like to do is, first of all, start by giving you some of the biology and the natural history of coyotes. It's it's um, the story makes better sense if you understand the biology of the animals but I also want to put them into context with other canids and so I'm going to show you some of the players in the story so I'm going to give you a little biology lesson first of all um, and then I'm going to talk about where our research has gone we formed something called the Atlanta Coyote Project and so I'll tell you a bit about that and then if we have time I'm going to show you some video which I think you'll find um, you know really interesting as well so uh, with that I'll get to it here so these are the players um, in the story to start off with and I've kind of simplified this slide but I call these the North American canids uh, when I refer to a canid I'm talking about a dog-like mammal um, and so we have a, uh, there are a number of canids around the world um, but these are the members of the genus Canis, and these are what we have here in North America. So you see the gray wolf in the upper left-hand corner, the red wolf in the upper right-hand corner, the coyote, which is, of course, the animal that we're going to talk about tonight, and then the domestic dog. And so you can see that the first, what we call the genus name in the scientific name, is all Canis. So they're all belong, they all belong to the same genus, but they are different species, meaning that potentially they do not interbreed with one another, that they are their own separate species. Now, species distinctions are not always as black and white as we want them to be. Um, and so we want to put things into nice, you know, discrete categories, and it's not always quite that simple. So that kind of complicates the story a little bit, for our, but for our purposes, these four animals are what we are, are interested in. Um, they really all started from this animal, the gray wolf, um, and then about a million years ago, so the, so the common ancestor between these animals would have occurred about a million years ago. Um, and then evolutionary splits uh, led to, the, uh, to these other animals. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about where these are, and obviously we're going to get to coyotes, but let me just talk first of, first of all uh, about coyote distribution through time, and we're going to relate that to where these other animals are found. So, what you're seeing here is a map of coyote distribution throughout North America. Coyotes are unique to North America. Uh, they, they evolved here, so we find them nowhere else in the world but North America. And so what you're seeing here is the historical range is in the, the darker orange color. So you can see that it was an animal that was west of the Mississippi River and essentially east of the Rocky Mountains extended a little bit on up into Canada, uh, down into Mexico as well. But, you know, this is the historical range. Um, you know, we get historical accounts of them through Lewis and Clark's expedition. Uh, Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark out to explore the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s. Lewis and Clark first encountered a coyote, although they didn't know what it was. They thought it was a wolf. Um, of course, they shot it to try to figure out what it was, as, you know, that's what they did back then. Um, but that was in South, what is now South Dakota. So that was the first time they saw this animal. Um, so then you can see that there starts to be this movement, both westward and eastward. So you can see late 1800s into the early 1900s, coyotes start pushing westward. They start pushing on up into Canada and into Alaska early 1900s through the 1950s, they start pushing into the Great Lakes region. Um, here in the southeast, 1940s, 1990s, they start pushing into the southeast. And so what you have now, currently, is coyotes are found throughout North America. They're found in all states but Hawaii. They have not been able to, to swim to Hawaii, but I'm here to tell you that coyotes are very good swimmers. So um, that's a little far to swim, but they are very good swimmers. They do well in a variety of habitat, habitat types, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, 
They do very well in rural environments, obviously, but they do equally well in urban environments. Coyotes have been found in Central Park in New York. Coyotes have been found on the roofs of buildings in Manhattan, believe it or not. One crawled into a cooler in downtown Chicago to escape the heat, got in with the Cokes and you know, the beverages, crawled into a cooler in a convenience store. <laughs> One got on the train at the Phoenix airport um, and rode the train. One got into an, air, uh, I'm sorry, into an elevator in a building. So these animals do very well in a wide variety of habitats. Um, and so we're going to talk about why that is. But so, the, the, so, you know, we talk a lot about, well, you know, coyotes are not native to this area or, you know, where are coyotes? Well, they're everywhere now. And this tells you a little bit about the historic expansion. Well, why did it happen? You know, that, that's the next question is, you know, how, how did this happen? Why did it happen? Well, there are two main reasons. And the first reason, the, the most important reason is the eradication of predators, top predators namely wolves, those animals that I showed you earlier. Um, we as humans, unfortunately, have had a real love-hate relationship with predators. You know, they're competitors. With, they eat the same things that we eat in many instances. We're fearful of them. Uh, of course, as Europeans came to uh, North America, they were afraid of these animals, rightfully so. They're large animals. They're wild animals. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we as humans did a really good job at eradicating these animals. We undertook systematic eradication programs that were sponsored by the federal government in many instances. We trapped them, we shot them, we poisoned them, we did everything we could to kill them. And this is both gray wolves and red wolves. Uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Um, second reason is habitat modification. We as humans, of course, modify the habitat. We convert forested areas into agriculture. We chop, chop trees down, you know, plant farms. Uh, we urbanize, we build cities. Both of those things are really good for coyotes. They, agriculture promotes small mammals, promotes crops. These are things that coyotes eat. So when you cut forests down and create agriculture, that's perfect for a coyote. You know, that's creating food and habitat for coyotes. When you urbanize, when you build, build cities, that creates perfect habitat. Uh, for coyotes as well. It, it may seem counterintuitive, but it gives them a place where they can escape guns. Uh, there's food in the form of the food that humans eat, whether it's in the form of garbage, you know, trash, compost piles, you know, you name it. Those are things, fruit, crops, gardens, you know, those are all things that coyotes would eat as well. So urbanization is actually good for coyotes, believe it or not. So, so those are the two main reasons. And um, these photographs, that one in the middle, you may recognize, was taken by this woman right here on Barry's campus. Uh, you know, beautiful photograph. The other two, that coyote, that, the picture of that coyote was taken in Reynoldstown um, in downtown Atlanta, about a mile from, you know, where the crow flies, from the intersection of I-85 and I-20, you know, so very close to downtown. This is a picture that we took at Barry. Uh, that was an animal that we trapped at one point and put a radio collar on and then released. So, that was taken out behind the, the horse barns uh, at Barry. So if you're familiar with that area. So, so back to, to another map. So again, we, we've got to talk about these other animals, uh, these, these other canid animals. And so what you're seeing here is the, the eastern half of North America. Um, and so the gray, you know, you can see Texas down there at the bottom. And so the gray is essentially following the Mississippi River. So the gray is the historic gray wolf uh, 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 distribution. So again, the gray wolf was an animal that is, and, and is an animal that was west of the Mississippi River, on out into the Rocky Mountains, on up into Canada. Its range also extended into the Great Lakes region. So that's the historic distribution of gray wolves. That's where we still find gray wolves. We do not find them in the numbers that we once found them, again, because we've been very good as humans at eradicating these, these animals. But if you've ever been out to Yellowstone uh, National Park, for example, in, in Montana and Wyoming, gray wolves were reintroduced there in the mid-1990s after a 70-year absence because humans eradicated them. But so the gray wolf, you know, again, more of a western and then a Great Lakes uh, animal. The green lines, which overlap essentially the, the gray area, that is the historic coyote distribution. So, um, so these two animals co-evolved together. 
the gray wolf and the coyote. So these are animals that have spent you know, hundreds of thousands of years together. Where they overlap, there is a clear distinction between these animals. The reproductive barriers are clearly in place. There is not any crossbreeding that occurs between these animals. The size differences are very great. I'll show you some, some numbers in a moment. The, the gray wolf is a very large animal. The coyote is a much smaller animal. There's a very clear distinction as to who's the top dog in that situation. Um, here in the southeast, we had the red wolf, Canis rufus. Um, and so you can see that the overlap between the coyote and the red wolf really was minimal. Um, so we did not have coyotes in this area. Um, the, the darker blue color around the Great Lakes region, we refer to that as an admixture zone. And so that's likely where some hybridization occurred. We don't know exactly when that occurred. Hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, there's some debate about what, when that happened. But likely what we had in this area, and we still do, we've got some gray wolves that are a little bit smaller in size. There's some debate about whether those are a subspecies or just exactly what they are, but, but they're gray wolves. Some people refer to them as timber wolves, Algonquin wolves, um, but they're essentially gray wolves. They tend to be a little bit smaller. Coyotes, but again, we eradicated many of those wolves, and so is that gray wolf population, particularly around the Great Lakes, which is where you're going to find most humans uh, historically, so there would have been more persecution and eradication of wolves. So as those wolf populations began to diminish, it allowed the coyote to kind of push in. And Here's where, you know, biology gets a little weird, you know, where one day it's your enemy, the next day it's your mate. Um, you know, we call that the Ali effect. If you cannot find a member of your own species to mate with, the drive to, to reproduce is very strong. And so there are instances of hybridization. When I say hybridization, I mean breeding between two different species. The, in this case, smaller gray wolves and probably slightly larger coyotes. And, and some of that is still going on. It's very rare. Those animals are sometimes referred to as coy wolves. Um, the media has made a lot out of that. Um, it's a, again, it's a rare event, but the, the reproductive barriers that separate these animals are not complete. And so there is physiologically the possibility that hybridization can occur. Uh, between those animals, and it likely did occur there in the Great Lakes region. So again, what happened? Well, we as humans, you know, we pretty much wiped out wolves in the Northeast. We really did a great job, unfortunately, of wiping out red wolves here in the Southeast. And so essentially there are no more red wolves. Um, the only place there are red wolves is that red dot, and that's called Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. That is in coastal North Carolina. If you've ever been to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, go to Manteo, uh, for example, and driving out to the Outer Banks, you pass right through Alligator River. And that site was chosen by the federal government uh, back in the 1980s, late 1980s, early 1990s. Hey, let's try to restore this red wolf population. Where can we put them where there are no coyotes? There are few people surrounded by water, a safe place where they'll be safe. That's the site they chose. Well, unfortunately didn't work out so well. Guess what, there are coyotes there now. Um, and the, the people there, are, some of them are not real happy about it. So anyway, that's where the red wolves are. But you know, what happens when in, in the natural world when you create a vacuum is nature abhors a vacuum. You know, nature very easily will fill that vacuum. And so the coyote just simply moved right on in. It wasn't brought here you know, artificially by people. Occasionally maybe that happened, but this was a very natural event. They were knocking on the door, you know, waiting to come in, and the thing that was keeping them out was this red wolf. Once the red wolf was gone, it opened the way up for the coyote to come in. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about diet in a little while, but um, that's not me, I hope. That, uh, but that's one of the things that separates these animals is that the, the red wolf and the gray wolf are carnivores, large animals that have you know, very narrow diets and need lots of space. Coyotes, they don't need a lot of space. They can live in Central Park in New York, 
and they can eat a wide variety of things. So our attempts to eradicate coyotes have not been successful, nor will they be successful because this is a very adaptable animal that does, again, very well around humans. Not so with wolves. Again, it's a, it's a different animal. You know, related, but, but different. And by the way, I, I should have said earlier when I showed this, this picture of the different players, um, I showed a dog, you know, Canis familiaris. I'll back up there. And, uh, this is a member of this canid group as well. It is a canid as well. It's the result of artificial selection of gray wolves by human beings. So domestic dogs are their own species, Canis familiaris. They come out of our artificial selection of gray wolves. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we as humans for thousands of years have taken tame gray wolves or gray wolves that we have attempted to tame and we have artificially bred them for the characteristics that we want. So a Chihuahua and a Great Dane are members of the same species, believe it or not. They're very different animals from one another, but they are members of the same species. They look much different than a, a gray wolf does from a red wolf. Um, so it, that's, biology can get a little confusing in that respect, but um, that's, a, that's a separate species of animal. So, is that the dog? That, yes, <laughs> he's, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, but yes, that was him. So I put this slide back in for my biology colleagues. Um, this is a, not a term, I wish I had coined this term, but I didn't, but it, I love this term, canis soup. So as technology, uh, as, as biology, uh, you know, is advancing, as we learn more about molecular techniques, um, as we become better at analyzing DNA, we're learning things about these animals. Um, and it's, as I said, it's not as clear cut as we always want it to be. And so we've got this kind of stew, this soup of varying canid DNAs mixing together, gray wolves and red wolves. There are so-called Mexican wolves, which are in the southwestern part of, of uh, the United States, there's only about 50 or 60 of them, but some recognize them as a subspecies of the gray wolf. The, there are western coyotes and there are eastern coyotes and there are the wolves in the Great Lakes. Most of the, the, the way in which these animals evolved and the natural reproductive barriers were geographic. They were found in different parts of the world, different parts of North America, and, and then they had very different, uh, great differences in sizes. You know, as we humans have changed the landscape and allowed these animals to move around a bit more, things get a little bit uh, soup-like. You get a little canis soup. Now, that's not a, I don't, I don't want to belabor that point, but uh, we're learning a lot more about the genetics of these animals. And what I have on the bottom of this slide is just a continuum that shows the sizes of these animals. And so that's really the best way to look at it is that Again, gray wolves on the right, the largest of these animals. Western coyotes on the, on the left here, smallest at about 25 pounds. And so again, the Western coyote and the Western gray wolf, remember that their ranges overlap. They co-evolve together. Very distinct differences in those animals, very large and very small. You know, as we move along the continuum, the red wolf is a little smaller than the gray wolf. You know, coyotes in the northeast are a little bigger than they are in the west. Coyotes here in the southeast are a little bit bigger than they are in the west. But the coyotes that we have here weigh about 30 pounds, okay? The largest one we've ever caught, I think, was 38 pounds. We caught it over on the river farm. If I had a dollar for every time someone said, I saw a coyote, it was 90 pounds. I saw a coyote, it was 60 pounds. I saw a coyote, it was huge. It was huge, huge, huge. Did you catch it and did you weigh it? No, I didn't, but I saw it, it was huge, okay. Well, until you catch that animal and you weigh that animal, you're not gonna convince me that of its size because again, from all that we know about these animals, you know, they are coyotes, they're not hybridizing with wolves because we have no wolves around here. So those, those animals are coyotes. Now I will grant you that these animals, dog-like animals in the wintertime, coat gets bigger. Summertime, coat gets small, you know, they, they molt, they shed their fur. So the size can look very different, but, you know, I've picked these animals up that look huge and they're not. They, they, they don't weigh that much. Um, so that's, that's important in the story. All right, well, a little bit about the, the biology of coyotes. So 
um, we're going to leave behind those other animals, all right, and we're going to just talk about coyotes now. So they are territorial. They are social animals like all canids are. They live in family groups, but they live in small family groups. And so you have a, a male and a female, mom and dad, we call that the alpha male and female. And they are residents. They are trying to establish territory. Just like any other organism, they need a place to live, they need a mate. You know, they need food, they need water. Wherever they can solve those problems, that's what they'll use. Some of us live in cities. Some of us live on large farms, you know, as humans. Same thing with coyotes. Wherever they are meeting their needs, that's all they need. You know, so, so I'm, I'm often asked, well, how big is the, the home range? It's a hard question to answer because it simply depends on where the animal is found. So, but from all that we know, we have resident family groups, again, the male and the female. And then they will have pups. They'll have their offspring. Um, and some of those pups may stick around and remain with the family group for a year or two, or they may not. So when we talk about, you know, a coyote pack, it's a family group. It's, these are all related individuals, and it's going to change throughout the year. So mom and dad, it's just like college kids, you know, have the kids, but it happens a lot faster. The kids grow up, time to leave, go off to college, okay, and then we're going to make room for the next batch. So, um, so that, that's what we see in, in the way of social structure. The ones that are not residents, we call them transients. They're out on the landscape looking for mates and a place to breed, a, a, place, a place to live. And so their home range is going to be a lot larger than a resident would. They're looking for their, they're looking to satisfy their needs. They're looking for a place to live. They're looking for a mate. So they're out there wandering around on the landscape, you know, testing. Can I live here? No, I'm going to get chased away. Can I live here? No, no, go, go away. I live here. So that's what happens um, as far as social structure. This is important. Point number two is that mom, dad, and any siblings from the previous year or years, they help to rear the offspring. So this is one of those behavioral characteristics that coyotes have evolved. Um, wolves will do this as well. Um, so, of course, the pups get born. The mom is going to nurse those pups in a den, but that doesn't last long. They come out of that den and they grow up fast and pretty soon they're able to eat solid food. And what's happening is dad and mom and again, any older brothers and sisters, they're going out and they're bringing food back. And what they're doing is they're regurgitating it is, is usually what they're doing. They're, they're chewing it up, they're swallowing it, and they're bringing it back to the den and they're regurgitating it and they're feeding that to the pups. So it's a family affair. They're all involved in the rearing of the offspring. Very seasonal breeders, they breed in the winter time. You know, and when I say winter, probably December, January. You know, we don't know exactly, um, you know, around here when that is, but, but that's one of the things that we're studying. And so, um, you know, sometime in the winter time, December, January, there's a 63 day gestation period. So, you know, two months later, here come the pups. So the pups are born in the spring. So um, we've got pups out there likely now, uh, you know, this being mid April, those pups have, have probably been born and in fact are about to come out of the den. Um, and as I say, they grow up fast. They are sexually mature in the first year of life. And I'll show you some pictures in the next slide uh, how that happens. Elusive animals. They will become crepuscular, which means active at dawn or dusk. They'll become nocturnal when living close to humans or they'll be out during the day. So seeing a coyote during the daytime is not cause for alarm. It's not, oh, it must be rabid, you know, this coyote's sick. No, they're just simply, again, very adaptable animals who are trying to adjust their behavior to not be hassled by humans, um, you know, until they become used to humans. And we'll talk a little bit about that. If they become used to humans, then you could see them active during the day, but usually they want nothing to do with us and they are, uh, they, so they adjust their behavior accordingly, their, their time of day when they're active. As, as I mentioned, successful in a variety of habitat types, uh, and they're really omnivores. You know, we think of them as carnivores, as meat eaters, but they will eat just about anything, as I'll show you in, in some slides in a few moments. And then again, there are those size differences. So there are some 
uh, differences geographically. Again, coyotes in their native habitat um, are smaller. And then the northeast, we usually see coyotes that are, are a little bit larger. Here in the southeast, they're, they're somewhere in between. Now, again, I won't, this is for the benefit of my colleagues sitting here in the middle, um, the, the biologists, that um, we're trying to sort out. I say we. I'm, I'm working with colleagues. I'm not doing much of that. I'm just contributing when I can. But, but there are canid geneticists that are really looking into this as to, you know, are these size differences due to diet or are they due to past hybridization events? And so n recent evidence is now even suggesting that the red wolf is not a separate species but is a, is a long ago hybrid between a coyote and a gray wolf. The, the red wolf is now, is, is 75% coyote and 25% <laughs> uh, wolf, it turns out. So that's a story for another day. Then. So. so here's the annual life cycle. This uh, was taken by a friend uh, down in Reynoldstown, Heather Setsi. Um, she took these in her backyard uh, in a very urban environment. And so what you see here, this is the end of March. And the first picture I know is a little hard to see, but that's a pregnant female. Um, you can just kind of make out her eye and uh, but anyway she's just kind of back in the brush there's some bamboo but I mean there's there's a fence and a rail line back behind there that is a very small amount of wooded area but we know she's pregnant uh, we could see that she was pregnant and so she's down in there so we were assumed she was going to give birth pretty soon so didn't see her didn't see her and then next thing we know at the end of of uh, June June 28th we see this pup and we were able to follow this pup throughout the next several months. And the pup's got a little scar, if you can see it. So this is all the same pup. I don't know if it's male or female, but it's the same animal. It's a little scar on its nose, uh, on, the, on the right side of its nose, you can see there. And so you can see it at three months, at four and a half months, at eight and a half, I'm sorry, at, at five and a half, at six and a half. And by eight and a half months down there in the bottom right-hand corner, you know, that animal, that's the middle of December. That animal is, is fully grown. It's sexually mature. It could potentially breed. But in order to breed, you need a mate and you need territory. So unless it has a mate and territory, it will not breed. It's either going to leave the family group and go off in search of a mate and territory, um, or it's going to stick around and help to raise its subsequent brothers and sisters. That works in biology too, where you're simply trying to pass on your genes. Um, th that's a strategy that, that you can employ is, you know what, I'm probably not gonna get lucky this year, so I'll stick around and help my mom and dad raise my brothers and sisters. And guess what, I share genes with my brothers and sisters, so I'm really helping myself by doing that. And so that's, that explains that behavior as to why they would do that. Um, same site. So again, this is someone's backyard, and that's how many coyotes ended up. Okay, that's not Zoo Atlanta, you know. That's that's somebody's backyard. Okay, so so there were seven pups. Um, you know, that, that's that's mom or dad with pup sleeping on it. You can see they're playful. Um, you know, well, this is. Uh, this is August, you know, the bottom picture is August. So you can see the size of the pups now. The people who lived here, you know, uh, God love them, you know, were very tolerant of these animals. They didn't, um, you know, disturb them. They allowed us to photograph them. Um, a lot of them ended up getting hit by vehicles. So the, how many of these pups actually survived, we don't really know, but probably not that many of them. And so mortality is high in coyotes uh, for a variety of reasons, as we'll talk about. So this, an, another way that we can age a coyote, of course, we have to catch it in order to age it, is by looking at its teeth or its, its dentition, you know, which is common in, in any animal. Um, you know, any vertebrate animal with teeth, any, any mammal. And so these are all animals that we collared actually at Berry College. Um, this on the far left here, this is in, in A, that's a yearling. In other words, that is an animal that was born, you know, during the previous breeding season. So it's, it's approximately a year old, maybe a little less than a year old. They have 
baby teeth that they lose just like a puppy would have and then the adult teeth come in and so this animal clearly has its adult teeth it's been to the dentist it's got nice clean it's been brushing and flossing you can see you know there's very little wear and tear there's no tartar buildup b okay that's a young adult probably somewhere between two and four years old and if you look you can see it's not the same animal, mind you, okay, but a, a, a slightly older animal, starting to see some wear and tear on the dentition. Um, it's a little hard to see in the black and white photo, but there's some tartar buildup, and so uh, the teeth are starting to wear down. And then the old guy on the end there, um, he's had a, you know, he's, he's older. He's probably older than five years. You can see the incisors on both the upper and lower gum are, are completely worn down. There's some broken teeth in there. Um, you know, that's just normal wear and tear. Um, we put collars on all of these animals. We followed that, anim that animal on uh, sea for a number of years and think that it lived about 12 years. Um, so, you know, which is probably old for a coyote, but, you know, I, I'm often asked, what's the lifespan of a coyote? You know, same as a dog. Um, depends on how well what kind of a life is it leading? How, you know, how able is it to find food? Um, you know, is it diseased? Is it, does it have parasites? Uh, you know, so um, mortality is probably pretty high um, in coyotes, but that animal was living on Berry College. What better place to live? You know? We actually caught it at the so-called deer dump. The deer dump is as it sounds. When a deer gets hit by a vehicle, it gets dumped here, and the coyote figured that out. And so the coyote was hanging out at the deer dump for easy meals. So, what do they eat? Well, you name it, okay? Picking figs off of a tree in the upper left hand corner, you know, looking for insects in the grass. That one, same backyard from Reynolds Town. Can you see the coyote and there's a squirrel hanging out of its mouth there? Um, I don't know what that one's eating, but seems to be enjoying it, I guess, whatever it is. But, you know, small mammals, mice, rats, squirrels, chipmunks, rabbits, that's a, a large part of its diet. Snakes, these are all things we've seen coyotes eat or seen in their scat. Fruit, love fruit. I'm going to show you some things if we have time about persimmon trees, grape, muscadine grapes, blackberries, as I said, figs, you know, watermelon, crops that somebody or fruit that someone might be growing, apples, you know, peaches, pears, um, grass, insects. I once found a scat on Viking Trail at Barrie that I went to pick up and put in a, in a bag and it completely fell apart. It was comprised entirely of beetle exoskeleton. It just, it, you know, I don't know how many beetles this coyote found to eat, but it was, it was amazing. Um, birds, uh, bird eggs, insects, I forgot beetles, grasshoppers, as I said, garbage, roadkill, you know, you, you name it. But you want to consider the size, the availability, the effort, etc. Deer are not on that list. They should be, okay, because you know, deer likely would be consumed, but you're talking about a 30 pound animal, you know, that hunts by itself. Is it going to take down a 90 pound buck? You know, probably not. Um, could it take a fawn? Yeah, probably so. You know, um, could it kill a, you know, and, and some of you who, who would know more about this, you know, that, that are agriculturalists or have farms, you know, I'm sure you can tell me stories. I'm not saying that a coyote won't eat what it can get its jaws on because it will. It's a wild animal. But you've got this wide menu of food to choose from. So when we see coyotes that become predators on livestock and start developing human conflict, the story is usually a little bit deeper than, you know, this is just a killer. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So so again, a very wide diet, lots of things that coyotes eat, lots of opportunities. This is one of the things that we have done in my lab. I've tricked students into working for me and telling them that it was a forensics crime scene that they were going to solve. But, uh, now we looked through coyote scat. This is from a project uh, from Yellowstone where we looked through hundreds and hundreds of coyote scat. Um, and we're looking for these so-called diagnostic items. So a vole 
the teeth of a vole, for example, look different than the teeth of a mouse, and the claw of a squirrel looks different from the claw of a chipmunk, and the hair of a, that's an elk, actually. We don't have elk around here, but we have deer, and it looks very similar. So that, an ungulate just means a hoofed mammal. So that's the hair of an ungulate as opposed to the hair of a rodent. So we can actually look at the hair and tell differences um, you know, between what the animal might have eaten. So you know, it's a somewhat crude analysis because we're you know, digging through scat, but it does give us an idea as to what these animals are eating. So. so when we talk about food, though, in the biology of coyotes, um, it, these are some important things to keep in mind. Is that, and, and some of these are, no, you know, these are not unique to coyotes. This is kind of basic biology. But litter sizes are linked to food. When you're living a good life, you are prosperous, you are healthy, you have lots of food, you can have more kids. And the same thing with coyotes. You know, litter sizes are linked to food. When there's lots of food, hey, let's have lots of kids. Okay, you can do that. More food means more coyotes. Um, reliable food means smaller territories and higher coyote dens densities. If you don't have to go as far and wide to find your food, you're going to stay put. You know, you're going to go in this one little small area. And so now you can have, you know, theoretically a coyote group here, a family group here, and one here, and one here. So, so when I say reliable food and food, you know, lots of food, what do you think I'm talking about here? <laughs> Any, any clues? <laughs> I'm talking about when people are providing food to, to uh, coyotes. So coyotes, for example, are attracted to cat food, okay? Then cats. So cats are not natural prey items. I'm not saying that a coyote would never eat a cat if given the opportunity. But, you know, again, you want to think about all of these other opportunities to eat cats. And, you know, does a coyote really want to start messing with a cat? You know, some cat, if, it's a, if it's a cat that's been declawed, yeah, well, that might be an, an easy fight, you know, but some cats could put up a pretty good fight. And so usually what we see happening is that people feed their pets outside. You know, if it's a cat, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, coyote starts coming around and getting used to this cat food. One night the food's not there. Oh, but there's the cat. You know, the coyote has now slowly been habituated to the presence of cat food and has come to rely on it and so that's when problems can develop. So once the fear of humans is overcome, you know, coyotes then can become more active during daylight hours. They come to expect food. Um, so that's when conflict starts to develop. You know, now what happens? Well, we got to kill these things. They killed my cat. You know, we're, I'm, we're having problems. What do we do? Let's get rid of them. Well, what happens is, is they don't walk around with signs on them. I'm the resident dad. I'm the resident mom. I'm junior from year one. You know, they don't have those signs. And so you don't know who you're killing. So if you kill the resident, what's going to happen? You've now opened up space for these transients who are all out on the landscape looking for an opportunity to come in. And boom, there it is. You know, they're going to come back in. You may knock the population back temporarily, but you know, now you're just creating space for more coyotes to come in. And now, when you have fewer coyotes, because you've killed some of them, so yeah, you, you have fewer, fewer coyotes temporarily, but now the food that's out there on the landscape, there's more to go around for the few that remain. And so what do they do? They start having larger litter sizes. And so you get into this, what we call a vicious cycle of trapping and killing. I got this picture from a woman through our website. She said, he eats here daily. I wonder why. That's a, you know, there's a pet food bowl that is filled with, you know, food there. So the coyote is essentially being fed. Maybe she wasn't putting it out for the coyote, or maybe she was. I'm not sure who she was providing the food for, but, you know, what, what's to stop this animal from coming in? And not just a coyote, a raccoon, a bobcat, you know, you name it. Um, so that's a no-no. So... Why killing doesn't work, okay? And this was a, um, a template that we got from the Humane Society of the United States who, you know, I know can be, you know, a controversial organization in some instances, but, you know, this is, this is good information. It's based on all that we know about coyotes and their social structure. So here on the left, 
We have a stable pack. We've got mom and dad, you know, A and A there, the alpha male and female. And they have some pups there in red. And then they have some, you know, of their kids, smaller, you know, from previous years. So we've got a stable pack. So they're not going to just produce a mountain of kids every year because they can only keep track of so many of them unless these you know, pups are going off and, and, and moving out across the landscape, generally they will maintain a pack size, a, a family group size that can be sustained by the food that's available on the landscape. So what happens if you start trapping and killing? Well, again, you don't know who you're killing. You maybe kill mom or dad, you kill some of the pups, you kill some of the, the subordinates. So oh, you've cut the numbers in half. Great, my coyote pup problem is solved. I got fewer coyotes. Well, look what happens in a couple of years, okay? Now we have a transient has moved in and found an unmated coyote who maybe is still around. Look what the litter size is now, okay? It's larger, and guess what else happens is those subordinates who were being suppressed from breeding by their parents are now released from that. So they start breeding, and they start having pups. And so now, what started off as, I'm going to reduce my coyote population, has now backfired. And you've got unintended consequences, and you've got more coyotes than you started with. We kill in this country almost half a million coyotes a year, it's estimated. The federal government kills 80,000 coyotes a year in the name of livestock protection. Something ain't working, okay, because we have a lot of coyotes, um, so we need better ways to go about this. So lethal control is not the answer. So it's a great quote that I like um, from Aldo Leopold. Aldo Leopold, if you're not familiar with him, wrote a book called A Sand County Almanac. He started um, his career working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, killing predators in the southwestern part of the United States. That was his job, was to kill wolves. And after doing that for a number of years, he said, you know, something, something doesn't feel right here. And that sh helped to shape his thinking. And so the quote is, harmony with the land is like harmony with a friend. You cannot cherish his right hand and chop off his left. That is to say, you can't love game and hate predators. The land is one organism. And, um, you know, that really describes our situation with predators, trying to kill our way out of so-called perceived problems um, is really going to backfire, as I say. Um, so it leads to all kinds of problems, you know, not to mention to even talk about ethical or moral implications that some people have problems with doing that. Um, so, and also, it disrupts food webs. Here's a simple food web. Does everybody have this? And I'll move on to the next one. So, yep. So this is not from around here because you're going to see some animals here that are not in the southeast. But I use this to show that, uh, you know, this is what ecology is all about, is that, you know, there is this interdependence among organisms. And so when you start tinkering with one, you don't know what's going to happen. We learn, we should have learned. I shouldn't say we learned. We should have learned our lesson many times over. Um, we've gone to great effort to reintroduce gray wolves into Yellowstone National Park. And it has been, it's been controversial, but, you know, by all accounts, it has been very successful at restoring that ecosystem by introducing the top predator back into the ecosystem. It has allowed trees to flourish. Why? Well, elk now have to be more concerned about wolves, so they're not browsing on the, the saplings of the cottonwood and aspen trees. And so now those trees can grow taller. Guess what? That shades the stream. Guess what? Birds, fish, you know, all kinds of things. And so um, we think that's happening with coyotes. That's one of the things that we're trying to figure out. We got rid of the red wolf. It's not coming back. The coyote has filled that vacuum. It's not the same animal, um, but healthy ecosystems have apex predators, and we don't have an apex predator. Essentially, the coyote is filling that role now. So. That's something that we're trying to learn more about, um, is the biological role. How are we doing on time here? Okay. So in 2015, I started the Atlanta Coyote Project, um, and we basically have a threefold mission, and that is public education and outreach like I'm doing here. 
it provides also an opportunity to people, for people to report and map sightings to our website, coyote activity. Nobody was collecting any of that kind of information. So our site provides an opportunity to do that. And then it provides a framework for our scientific research. So we've got lots of students involved in it. We have citizen scientists. You can get involved if you would like to do that. We called it the Atlanta Coyote Project just to kind of brand it geographically to the southeast. But, um, you know, yeah, we look at Metro Atlanta, but we look at really, you know, the whole southeast. We'll take information wherever we can get it. And so um, one of the things, uh, there, yeah, so one of the things, as, as I mentioned, one of my students, Joe Mann, uh, helped to prepare these maps. So as I mentioned on our website, which I'll show you in just a moment, people can go and, and report a sighting. They can explain what happened, you know, if they want. And so th these are mapped sightings from starting in 2015 to last year, 2017. Now, that's Metro Atlanta. It's a little hard to see. Uh, Atlanta is right there in the middle. Now this does not, you have to take this with a grain of salt, this does not say that the coyote population is increasing, okay? This just simply means more people are reporting to our website. So, uh, and we're now going to be in the process of kind of looking at this at a, at a landscape scale, doing some GIS analysis to see are there, are there landscape patterns associated with the distribution of these animals. So it's just providing us with a data set that we're going to uh, be looking at. So. This picture, Gina was present when this picture was taken. She magnanimously stepped aside, and Melanie Abney, it's not, Melanie's not here, is she? No, uh, actually was the one who took this picture, but I think Gina saw the animal first. This is something, this is that uh, we're very interested in. We published a paper in 2014. Uh, black coat coloration. This is, we call it melanism. It's a, a trait that occurs in many different animals. It's a genetic trait. Um, we know the same gene occurs in dogs. So if you have a black lab, it's the same gene. Uh, we know it occurs in gray wolves and in red wolves. And, and by the way, color is not a good way to di distinguish all of these critters from one another. So we say red wolves, some red wolves are red, some of them are black. Gray wolves, some of them are white, some of them are black, some of them are gray, some of them are white. Uh, coyotes. Turns out that this trait is unique here in this part of North America for some reason. Um, we don't see black coyotes in, out west, don't see them in the northeast. So we think this trait might have jumped from the red wolf to the coyote as the coyote was coming from the west and encountered uh, red wolves because we know that the trait was reported in red wolves. So whenever we get a black coyote, not purposefully, but if it gets shot or gets hit by a car or something like that, we take tissue and we send this to colleagues at Princeton University who uh, have a large canid ancestry genetics uh, program going on. So that's, that's in process. So I published this paper uh, with a former student, Justin Edge, who really uh, was a student who got me involved in coyotes. That's Justin holding the coyote there. So this, these were some, this was some work that we did. That's Katie E.D. Owens, who works for the Nature Conservancy here in Rome now. Former Barry students early on in the Coyote Project. Um, these are some more recent students. Robbie Elwanger, that's Joe Mann. Uh, Robbie again, Robert Stills. Uh, Jeremy Hooper, who was a graduate student that worked with me from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Uh, Ellen uh, Dimet is from Emory University. Um, so we've had a number of students get involved in the project um, doing a variety of things, you know, whether it's field research or public outreach and education. This is called the Lantern Parade. Uh, this is in downtown Atlanta. Uh, it's a fascinating, fabulous thing. It goes along the Beltline in downtown Atlanta with 80,000 people. It's a really cool event. And we carried this lantern. Um, which Kathy Clements, who's in graphic design at, at Barry, designed and built that for us, and it was a big hit. We had people howling and yelling at us as we carried this thing down the, the belt line, so it was, it was very cool. So let me just show you if I have time. Are we good on time? Okay, if I can get out of this. So this is our website, um, and so 
it's, a, it's an extensive website. There's lots of information on here. You can go in here and then find out much of what we were, uh, what I've been telling you about tonight. There are drop down menus that, you know, talk about the biology of coyotes. Um, so those, those kinds of things, uh, you can go in and, and learn about that. Oh, I should, probably shouldn't have done that. Oops. Let me go back to that. Sorry. Okay. So anyway, there's, you can learn about things. You can report a coyote sighting and help us to generate those maps. And, and by the way, that aspect of uh, the website was developed by my colleague Nadim Hamid uh, in computer science at Barry. did a fabulous job putting that together. It's real user friendly. You click on that, gives you a map, you drag the cursor, you can report anything you want. You can donate to the project if you want. Barry has been great. We've set up a crowdfunding uh, donation page and so you can go there and any money that's donated goes to uh, helping us with the project. But what I want to show you, if I can get there, is that we, oops, so at the bottom of our web page, we uh, publish sort of timely research or things, information. So these are all kind of what we call blog posts. And so I mentioned, uh, so you can go at your leisure and, you know, read about various things. We were talking a little bit about coyotes and mange. This is a uh, a little video if I have some time to show this. So as I mentioned earlier, coyotes eat a wide variety of things and fruit is a major component of their diet and we've come to learn that persimmon fruit is a favored fruit item of coyotes. Um, and so I had been, I knew for years because I would see it in their scat and I said if we can find the persimmon trees we're going to find the coyotes and it worked like a charm and so this footage is from cameras that we have used uh, at persimmon trees some of them on Barry's campus some of them uh, across metro Atlanta so let me just show you a little of this video. Well, hopefully. I'm worried that our Wi-Fi connection is maybe. Let me try to go smaller and see if that helps. Well. Anybody, any ideas? Let's see. Can, play button, is that? Yeah, it's trying to play. Bruce, yeah. you're a genius. <laughs> okay, so this is actually on the road up to the House of Dreams, if any of you know where that is. And the, the persimmon tree is in the back. And this, you can see this is end of September. The coyote's literally looking up in the tree, you know, waiting for these fruits to fall. And um, sure enough, a few hours later, note the time is 1.20, here's 8 o'clock, it's back, some fruits have fallen. Uh, we had a camera on this for several weeks. People would walk by, two minutes later the coyote would come out of the woods and eat the fruit and go back into the woods. People walking by with their dogs, no coyote, two minutes later, you know, there's the coyote. Um, there it is, a, you know, a couple of days later. And they just love these. And, it, it, and if you've ever eaten a, an unripe persimmon, it's not something you will soon forget. Chocked full of tannins, it'll turn your mouth inside out. Um, they will eat them unripe, as far as I can tell. Um, I, so this is something that we're going to pursue. We're, we're in the process of learning more about this. But, uh, you know, really, really interesting situation. So that's something that I wanted to show you. One other one that I wanted to show you, if I can get out of this, is um, we've been involved in a somewhat of a controversy and that is what's called the Georgia Coyote Challenge and some of you may have heard of this and the Georgia Coyote Challenge is, a, is essentially a coyote killing contest and so um, hunters are encouraged to kill coyotes and turn in the carcass for the opportunity to win a lifetime hunting license. Um, we think this is bad science, we think it's unethical 
Um, we're not arguing against hunting. We're simply arguing that to set up a contest is, is bad science, as I said, and it's unethical. So we've, uh, we've spoken out about this. Uh, if you feel strongly about something like that, you can click on that link. Uh, we sent a letter to the governor. We sent a letter to the DNR. We've not gotten any response, but we're going to continue to work on that. But the point is, is that one of the statements that is often used is that, well, coyotes are killing all of our native wildlife. Okay, well, this is a post that we made in response to that. And um, this is... Here's, this is one site, and this goes on for, so if you need to leave, but I think you'll, I'll try to. So here's, this is a site in suburban Atlanta where we've been uh, using cameras extensively. So you're going to see there are clearly coyotes in this site. You'll see them several times. This is just a stream in someone's backyard. It's a, you know, it's a fairly wooded place. So clearly there is a resident group of coyotes. There's been breeding that has gone on two years. I just got footage. I saw the female was pregnant on March 23rd. Now, same camera, you know, same site. You're going to just see this array of animals uh, walk by this that um, really dispels that myth that the presence of coyotes means that everything else is being eaten because it's just simply not the case. I'm going to stand out of the way so you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a bobcat. Well, it's a little deceiving as to how little it is. It's the bobcat is going to go over and mark this bush. So I want you to remember that spot. Something's been here before. <laughs> How far apart were the visits by the Bobcat and the Rabbit? Yeah, you know, I don't remember the exact dates on that, not far apart, you know, maybe a day or two. Well, it's not like it got washed away by rain. Right. And, you know, we continue, we have consistently for two years gotten footage like this. In fact, this was some work that we just presented and we're working on a manuscript. <laughs> now, we've actually gotten footage, you won't see it here, of... Uh, not a snapping turtle, which is what that is, but of a box turtle shell in a coyote's mouth and pups playing with the shell, almost as if they were teething on it. Was the turtle still alive? No, it was just the shell of the turtle. And whether they killed the turtle or not, I don't, I don't know. 
you know, I'm sure given the opportunity, they would eat it, you know, but. Yes. This is in Roswell, Georgia. Gina, what do you call that? Yeah, juvenile. I think it's a juvenile red-tailed hawk. But it's eating a frog. Watch the frog. It's still alive. Not for long. Not for long, but it hangs on longer than you would think. You'll see it's still kicking. I've seen a lot of red-shouldered hawks eating frogs. Making sure he puts his foot on Yeah. Affiliated woodpecker calling in the background. <laughs> That's a, mm, that's a great horned owl. Now these animals, you know, might not necessarily be prey items for coyotes, but, you know, they're going to be eating small mammals and other things. So, you know, it's, it's somewhat indicative of the diversity um, that would be in this area of the, of the things that these raptors would eat. Is this in a residential area or what's the closest? Yeah, there, there are homes all around here, so yes. It does, yes. So the cameras, yeah, cameras are, are both heat and motion sensitive. So and it's not like, you know, these animals were here one day and then we never saw them again. Again, there is, we consistently see, you know, a, a wide array, array of biodiversity, including coyotes. We know there's a resident group of coyotes that are in their third year. And this ends with a view of spider build a, net, a web around the camera. I first saw it, I thought, what in the world is going on here? And that was it. So, so that's that. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll stop there and be happy. I'm sorry if I went over a little long, but I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir. Where do foxes fit in all So foxes are members of the canid family as well, but different genus, so more distant cousins. And so around here we have red foxes and we have gray foxes. And uh, we've got, you know, videos. I didn't let the first video of the persimmons play long enough, but the fox would have come up. So... So distant cousins, you know, canids, but, but of different genus.
a uh, different genus. So, Denise, yes? So, if the wolf and a coyote mate, mm -hmm. would, it, would the offspring go mate with a coyote or a wolf? So, that's the question. You know, it depends on what wolf you're talking about. Now, the problem they're having in coastal North Carolina, as I mentioned, let's put red wolves out there. There are no coyotes. Well, that didn't work. Okay, so we've now got hybrids between red wolves and coyotes. Um, because they, neither one of them could find enough mates. And so what they have done, one of the management techniques is to capture coyotes, sterilize them, and release them back in. And so they hold the territory. They don't create this vacancy for more coyotes to come in. There's mating that goes on, but there's no successful reproduction that's going on. So it's... Um, it's hard to say, you know, for sure. Um, you know, it may depend on what sex individual you're talking about and, you know, the, the success of finding um, who you're going to find. So, and, and it's, a, it's a relatively rare event, you know, occurring in relatively isolated places. So, um, so as far as, you know, how that would happen. But, you know, that does, just does bring up this point of, of what we call introgression and that melanistic trait. If you know, you get this hybridization and then the offspring goes and mates back with the parent population. That's how the gene gets from one species to the other. It kind of jumps through the, the hybrid and back in. Yes, sir. All right, so on that note, why would you think that that gene came specifically from the red wolf and not our dogs that we have around? Well, you know, and there is some evidence that now that it did come from dogs, in fact. So, um, I read that just recently, you know, so we really don't know for sure where it came from. Um, you know, it could have, it could have originated in dogs, but the coyote could have picked it up, essentially. So in other words, there could have been some hybridization between red wolves and dogs. So the gene jumped from the dog into the red wolf. And then there was some hybridization between coyotes and red wolves, and the gene jumped from the red wolf into the coyote population. So, you know, ultimately where it originated, um, I, I don't know for sure. So, I recently read uh, when Liam Barkin was in Florida mm -hmm. that he referred to those wolves down there as being a, 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 a piebald. Yes. However, in North Georgia, yes. he referred to them as red, and he, he noted the difference. Yeah. And the Spanish had come in over 100 years before Barker, and yeah. they brought dogs in there. Yeah. So again, you know, there's, there are probably isolated instances where, you know, some hybridization may have occurred, you know, in, in these instances that you're talking about. Um, so there's a lot of debate in the canid genetics world. You know, but again, this is now, we're starting to tease some of this apart, but oh man, it gets heated. You know, um, there's, a, there's a great article that uh, a friend of mine wrote recently saying, the koi wolf is not a thing. And his argument was, you know, we're trying to make this out to be, you know, there's a lot of media attention um, that we need to call this a separate species. No, the point that he was trying to make is that biology can be messy, you know, is that there's interbreeding that goes on and we kind of have to wait for time and evolution to settle some of these things. The same argument, well, we shouldn't conserve, let's, let's forget about the red wolf and remove all federal funding for the red wolf. Well, you know, people are arguing that species designations are not the only things that we should use for conservation. You know, a distinct, unique population that has unique morphology, that's good enough. You know, let's try to conserve that animal. So, again, there are strong debates about that. So, yes? We live in a heavily, a heavily wooded neighborhood. Yes. And recently, an email went out to the neighborhood saying, oh my gosh, we saw a, a full-grown, sick-looking coyote. Uh-huh. What's the proper response to that? Leave it alone? Yeah, because unfortunately... Uh, and we have this all on our, our website if you want to go look for it. But unfortunately, you know, wildlife, uh, you know, control, they won't do anything about it because you can imagine the difficulty in trying to catch, you know, the animal and, and then what are they going to do with it, you know. So it's not going to come when it's called, you know. 
they're not going to go out and set traps. It's simply too much effort, too much cost, um, and it probably won't be successful. So, you know, one of the, you may have seen one of the things we see is mange occasionally. And we know that those animals, coyotes that get mange, become a little bit more problematic. No surprise, they're desperate. You know, they're, they're, they're going to die of exposure eventually. So they're desperate, looking for food, you know. So that's, we oftentimes see when there's conflict, it's oftentimes between an animal that has mange and, and people. There's really, and people, I get these emails, what should I do, what should I do? Well, unfortunately, there's not much you can do. Uh, yet, other than be, be smart, you know, be, be proactive is what we say. Use what, what we call passive management. And we have all kinds of literature that we can blast out to neighborhoods you know, if anybody asks, we get this all the time. We have, you know, brochures, dogs and coyotes, what to do about, you know, don't feed wildlife, cats and coyotes, you know, targeted to specific audiences. So we have the resources if anybody wants them. And we also have connections with, with farmers and ranchers who have employed successful techniques at coexisting with predators, coyotes in particular. And we've connected people that way and it's been really rewarding to see that you know is that people say oh well I never thought of this and you know and because I'm not a farmer you know I'm not, and so you know it doesn't mean much coming from me but if I can put it in someone in touch with somebody who is and has had success then then it means more to them so I was wondering about house you've shown uh, yeah. down, yes uh, had a very high Yes. Were they clearing that fence, or was there some other way they were getting them out of They they were oh the fence on the yeah on the property they were going right under that fence so it was a and in fact um, this these pictures up here so uh, some of these excuse me these pictures that that go by that that's that backs up to the rail line. Uh, so there was some kudzu and things back in there, and then the people had built a fence, but the coyotes just went in and out of the fence at will. There was, and we get that question a lot. This may, I got an email today. There's a, it, I just shake my head. It's a neighborhood in Atlanta, a very affluent neighborhood. They hired a trapper paid them thousands of dollars. A trapper, of course, is going to tell you, I will solve your problem, you know, and so the trapper has a vested interest, comes in and, you know, ends up exacerbating the problem. These people are now going to do it again. And now they want to build a fence around their entire neighborhood. I don't know how many miles of fence. They want to build a fence around their neighborhood. You know, at, at, what, at the cost, I just can't imagine because coyotes will jump fences. We say that, you know, a fence, you've got to put a roller on top so the coyote hits it and rolls off. You know, it's got to be a very high fence and then it's got to have a roller on top of it. And it's got to be in the ground or they'll tunnel under it. So I'm going to have to tell these people, save your money, but some people just won't listen. Oh, donate your so, money. Or donate your money. Better yet. <laughs> better yet. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Yes. On the black coyotes that you said are, are here in Northwest Yes. Um, they're, they're, they're relatively rare, but I will tell you that we've, um, when we were, we were catching some coyotes, we did a two-year project where we put some radio collars and we caught 10 coyotes and two of them were melanistic. And there was one on our property as well. Yeah, and, and then, you know, this one here that I showed you was likely the offspring of one of those that we saw on Barry. I'm just guessing about that, but it was caught in the same place. It was photographed in the same place where we had previously captured a melanistic coyote. I will tell you that on Sullivan's Island, South Carolina, Sullivan's Island is just right off of Charleston. Guy had a camera trap in his backyard on the island. Gets a black coyote on it, sends me the, an email and pictures of it. It was great. The next year, a whole litter of coyotes, all melanistic. So what, if, what did the local authorities do? They came in and they killed them all, you know. Um, but we got tissue samples from that. But recently, I was contacted. Coyotes have made it to Deweese Island, which is north of there. It's just off of Isle of Palms. They swam. 
Uh, the, that was my first question. So we know they got there. My first question, are any of them black? Because Sullivan's Island is just like two islands down. And so I'm really interested to see if they, they colonize northward. But, but how far have they swam to get to another island? Well, Sullivan's, or Deweese is only a quarter of a mile from Isle of Palms. But I, I mentioned earlier swimming. I was in Yellowstone. If you've ever been to Yellowstone, um, in the Lamar Valley, the river, the Yellowstone River, I guess that is the widest, swiftest bend in the river. Coyote came, I saw it come along, wandered into the, it was cold, wandered into the water, swam, took about 10 minutes against, you know, the currents going like nothing got out the other side, shook off and went on its way, you know, like there was nothing to it. So I was, I was really shocked. So no, you know, no qualms about jumping in the water and swimming a, a long ways, really. Those do look like they're pretty good size, almost like, you know. Yeah, that, that, yeah, they're, so they're good swimmers, definitely. Anything else? Well, if there's no more questions, yeah. I just want to say thank you so much. For thank you. Speaking with us this evening, I invite you all to go and see the gallery. It'll be open until 8. And thank you all for being here this evening. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Mm. Go see these wonderful photographs if you haven't seen them yet.